the mouth. Breathe life into us. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Y'all ready? Let's all stand. What? Um, sorry, what? Everybody needs to sit back down, I'm told. Sorry. Lights back on. Good morning, guys. Uh, everybody knows what today is or this whole month has been. It's Pastor Appreciation Month. And nobody appreciates our pastors more than the Point uh, Fellowship, right? We love them. We appreciate them. We're pulling this on y'all at the last minute because we knew that you would probably try to say no. I told them if you had on the mic to mute your mic because you weren't allowed to talk. <laughs> anyway, we love you guys so much. Um, we could all take turns and we would be here all day sharing with you uh, times that you've made a difference in each one of our lives and how much you both mean to us. We may not always show it, but we do recognize how you lay your lives down every Amen. single day for us. And we love you and we appreciate you for your faithfulness. Y'all are both very faithful servants. And at, when I say that, I mean that because you serve the body that you leave, lead. And I, I appreciate that and I know everyone here does. So before we come up for praise and worship, I just want to encourage those of y'all that brought cards. We're taking up a love offering. We're just going to bring them up to these two boxes. If you brought cards, just bring your card. If you, if you uh, want to give online, you can give online. And just be sure you put the comment, uh, Pastor Appreciation, or Special Offering, oh, either one, okay? Um, I just, what? 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 Oh, <laughs> that's a great picture. But what it comes down to is we love you guys very, very much, and we can't thank you enough, and a small a, a love offering and cards is not near enough, but we hope it blesses your hearts as much as y'all bless ours every single day. Uh, we appreciate you every day, and we need to be holding our pastors up in prayer every single day. They need, they need to be one of the top of our prayer list every single day to keep them going and keep them moving and feeding us and loving on us. So as you come forward for praise and worship, just know that the two baskets this morning are going to be the pastor appreciation baskets, so you can put your cards, your love offering in there, or you can give online. Just, just be sure you designate what it's for, okay? We love you guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, let's, pra let's praise the Lord. Come on. Sorry, that was loud. We love you.
just we've only just begun to see all of heaven come we fear we bow at the father's perfect love come on your kingdom because your kingdom is at hand and the gates of hell won't stand now in victory we lift our song
such a joy in here this morning and there is a sense of pure freedom there is just a sense just I can't even describe it it's just overwhelming Ooh. thank you Lord for your joy thank you Lord for your truth we honor you that you are our victory in all things when we put our hope our faith and our trust in you because it is
to sing this bridge again. There's authority and unity in the house when we sing this. Because it is finished. It is done. Come on. The blood of Jesus. Oh. Cause it is finished, it is done. The blood of Jesus overcomes. It is finished, he has won, he has won. Come on, we're going to shout it. It is finished. And it is And they cry. 
Father, we come to you this morning. We say you are holy. Our heart's desire is to give you all of it that we have. To give you that last bit of our heart that we hold back. To give you our time. gifts, our talents, our desire is to glorify you in all we do. You are holy and worthy of all praise and honor. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and give them a big hug. Tell them you're glad they're here today. Ushers, if you could come forward, please. Praise and worship. That was awesome. Good job. Reach over and grab your neighbor's hand. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, we desire, as we have worshipped you, Father God, with our hearts, uh, now, Father, we worship you with our honor uh, and our tithe and our offering, and we bring it forth to you, Father. We say thank you, we praise you, Father, that you bless us, you give us the opportunity to, to have things and, and to be blessed, and jobs and food on our table and our homes and our clothes, Father God, we thank you so much. According to your word, we bring that back to you, a tithe, a, tithe, a representation of the whole, that you would redeem the rest, Father. We thank you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Go ahead, guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. God's good, amen? amen. Are you ready to be blessed? The most awesomest preacher we have is going to bless you this morning. But I wasn't feeling good, so Pastor Ned is going to preach. God's oh, good, amen? Come on. You want this? Uh, real quick. Um, remember, we have the at five thirty. We're having our uh, Gateway Fellowship, which is um, if anyone hasn't like taken our personality class, is the first one that we're going to do. Um, it is just a way for you to hang out with us. Normally, do we do intro to uh, the point and we kind of tell you our story, but we're going to do a little bit different this time. We're going to do our personality class, which is hilarious. Um, you will for sure laugh as we make fun of everybody who's not like you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's at 5.30. And so if you haven't registered, we have a really good group coming. Um, but I'd ask that you please let me know um, today if you are going so I can make sure I have enough books printed. Yeah, yeah. And next Sunday is Fall Forward. It's going to make us fall down because we're all going to be. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I was going to fall back. Did I say forward? Yeah. That's how I would fall, would be forward. <laughs> Backwards is not a good thing. But forward, I'll go. Fall back. I had a, a video, like, it was funny. Um, you know that Johnny and Chachi from the Skit Guys? They have the funniest video for the time. <laughs> for the save, they like saving this time. I laughed so hard yesterday when I was watching. And I was going to do it, and then I forgot. So, oh, well. I get to enjoy it, and you don't. So, because um, I know what I saw. Ha, <laughs> ha. Oh, 
too funny. All right. Let's pray. I feel really, really like, I don't know. Um, I walked in the building for Sunday school, and I was like, I was in a good mood. Like, I was tired, but I was like, hey. I walked in, I, I like came into the cloud, and there was a lot of just joy in his presence. Even during Sunday school, it's kind of harsh. For those of you who are here, we know we got kind of beat up just a little bit. Um, it's all known as fault. But we did get beat up. But even in the midst of all that, we're like, woohoo, this is awesome. So I still feel that. He's definitely here. And I feel like the Lord is going to have some, um, some expect that word, expectancy. What's, I, I screwed up a word in Sunday school, too, like prevalent or something I, I said wrong. I was like, prevalent. Like, that's not even a word. You know, my, our, our spiritual daddy, he would make up words. Brother Walker was so funny. He would combine two words and make them his own. And he'd put his own little definition on it, and we used to. We would wait every time he preached, what word was he going to make up today? That If you told him it was not a real word, he would not believe you. It was so funny. <laughs> you snorted. <laughs> you did one. What was the one you did? Surrenderance. Yes. Lord, we give you our surrenderance. I'm like, that's not a word, Ashley. We were praying, and she totally she messed me. It is now. And we've, I did a whole devotional on it. So, yeah. Surrenderance. <laughs> There's a special anointing for that, just so you know. <laughs> oh, amen. Anyways, I do feel like the Lord is going to stir some hope uh, into uh, all of us, but some of you even more so. And I really believe that there's um, a faith deposit for a birthing. I'm going to talk about birthing. Whoa. But I really feel like the Lord is, there's uh, some of you, and you know, and we're so glad you're here. I'm so glad you feel better. You know, we're just going to believe God for just such a great healing. This warfare has got to stop. Amen? Huh? I'm going to before we... I'm, I'm going, I was, you want to do it now? Okay. Well, I was going to pray for it after faith was ignited, but... Is that okay? We can do that. Who's got healing? Beth, Judy, go back. To, let's lay hands on Frank real quick. We're going to pray now, and then I'll pray again. Our apostle said, pray now. So we will pray now. Amen. All right. Well, Father, we just thank you right now for the healing that you paid for on Calvary. And we just say that we just lay a hold of that covenant of healing. And I ask you, Father, that there would be a complete restoration of everything, Father, physically, emotionally, naturally, that whatever the enemy has tried to stop up in their lives, we just call their household blessed and healed and whole. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, wholeness. I heard a word this morning. I was listening to um, uh, a thing pop up from Jensen Franklin, uh, uh, who I really like. Uh, anyways, but he was talking about how, um, you know, we should never shoot for healing. We should shoot for wholeness. Uh, I'd rather be whole than healed. You know, the nine, le- the ten lepers went and they, got a, they had a healing touch from the Lord but only one was made whole. So they walked away. They could see, but their nose was still messed up. You know what I mean? Whatever they lost in their disease was gone. But the one who came back was restored to wholeness. So whatever he lost from that disease, he gained back because he came to worship Jesus. Amen? So we we want wholeness, not just healing. Amen? All right. So once you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures to kind of lay a foundation, and then we're going to go from there. I'm going to, let's just, I'm going to pray. First, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word, the truth. We say plant it deep within our hearts today so that it bears much, much fruit for the glory, the honor, and the praise of Jesus, the one who's above every one, every God. Hmm. Jesus, we just magnify you. We thank you with praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that you did cry out from the mercy seat for us, and we just are so grateful. But Father, let us be people of faith where we begin to walk into the complete wholeness and promise of your word in our lives as a demonstration of your glory in the earth. Let today be marked as the day that we've turned from unbelief 
and began to believe you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So Mark chapter 11, verse 22, and the Amplified, it says, And Jesus replying said to them, Have faith in God constantly. Hmm. That's a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> to have faith constantly. I don't know about you, but I don't walk in constant faith. It's kind of up and down. Depending on the circumstances and who's in my face, who I'm getting mad at, or who cut me off on the road, or, you know, what ache I have in my body. There's always something warring against constant faith in all of us. But if Jesus said, have faith constantly, that means there is a door that is open for us to have faith constantly. He didn't say that to us so it would be a place of, you know, strife and um, a, a constant, like a, a warfare that we're, we're never going to attain to it. But he said, have faith constantly because he said, I've given you my spirit. You know, the words to all the songs today were, are so significant because they laid a foundation for what the Lord is speaking today. I'm very grateful for that. Um, we, we don't want to we never want to put our hands in manipulation on what God wants to do. And so, you know, when I come in for, to minister, I don't come for prayer because I don't want to lead it in any certain way. But then when God begins to just move all the chess pieces and the board and everything's so perfect, it's so glorious. So let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 16 real quick. I'm going to give you three scriptures and then you can... Put your Bible down, but you should take notes. I'm just saying. Romans chapter, did I say four? Okay, good. <laughs> Verse 16, talking about Abraham here. It says, therefore, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace. Okay. And then he says to make it stable and valid and guaranteed. So Paul tells us here that we have to, we have a promise. And if we want the promise to come about in our lives, that it's going to come about through faith. And faith is activated because God has given us grace. Now we activate faith by love, but the grace of God has given us the ability to have faith. And faith releases the kingdom of God and the earth. It is the currency. It's one of the currencies of heaven. You know, we have a lot of denominations in our, in our you know, money system. But, and I believe in heaven is the same thing. That there are, you know, faith, hope, and love. Um, you know, grace, there, you know, hope. All, I mean, all, I said hope twice because hope is on the air. But those things are currencies. And they, they help us to lay a hold of what God has promised to us and what he has already foretold that's going to happen in the earth. He, he has a plan, a destiny, a purpose, a beautiful outcome for every single one of us. And for us to come into the fulfillment of that, we have to have faith. And when faith leads us to the fulfillment of a promise, the promise then is a testimony in the earth that Jesus is alive and that God is not just real, but he is in love with us, and he wants to do good for us, okay? So faith is the outcome of the grace of God. Paul tells us that when we hear the word of God, then we believe it. We come into salvation by our faith, by believing what we heard, but it's because grace was activated first by Jesus. He loved us first, and then we respond to him in love. Now, in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, and I'm going to um, read this out of the Passion Translation, but you can write the reference down and uh, look at it later, I guess. Or Amy will put it up. Maybe New Living, maybe closer. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, he says, You see, every child of God overcomes the world, for our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. Wow. Listen to that again. Because what are we seeing about just a minute ago? Victory. The war is over. It's settled. It's done. It's finished. If Jesus left the grave behind him, we leave the grave behind us. 
If he gave surrender, we give surrender because it, it releases the kingdom of God. And John is writing here, and he's like, we overcome the world by our faith, not by how hard we work or how much money we have or how smart we are. None of those things matter. What overcomes the world is our faith. So that means no matter what you face, no matter what circumstance, no matter what battle, what, what frustration, no matter what it is, the only way for you to come to the other side of that is by faith. There's no other way. I mean, it can't be frustrating. I get that. But faith is the only thing that gets you to lay a hold of the promises of God. So every place in us that is not satisfied or not fulfilling what we believe God has promised us is, one, maybe we don't have it and we're frustrated because we haven't really faith for it, real faith, you know. A lot of our faith is real unbelief. <laughs> and then we have these moments of faith. But you know, most of the time we're like, God's not going to do it. God's not going to do it. And then we have a moment in like, corporate wor- worship and we're like, oh, you gave me the victory. I love you. And then we go home we're like, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Um, but... <laughs> Or if we have something in our life that um, is not fulfilled yet, if we're in a place of faith and hope, then we still expect it, and we're looking forward to it, so we're still operating in faith, okay? When we see frustration come and fear come, um, when despair, disappointment, all those things come, that means we've moved out of a place of believing God, what he's going to give us. But every believer is going to be challenged. The areas of your faith are going to first have a place of fear inside of you or disappointment or brokenness or loneliness. All those, those bad things that we go through, those are the very places where God's trying to initiate in us a grace for faith. Amen. Oh, that's a good word. I like it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, and again, you can just write the reference down. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. It says, when you're placed in the anointed one and joined to him, circumcision and religious obligations can benefit you nothing. All that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. Wow. All that matters right now in your life All that matters is that you have faith activated by love. But what I have this and I have this, no. All that really matters is that you have faith activated by love. So as you love Jesus and you receive the love of God, it activates a faith inside of you that lets you know you've overcome no matter what it is you're facing. And I think sometimes it's asinine that I'm going to be preaching on faith <laughs> when I've been through more hell <laughs> lately than is, shouldn't be possible. Not just physically, but also in my mind and the things that, you know, and the testing, the trial that I've been going through. But I've, I'm learning something in, which makes it all worth it. I mean, like, you know, if Daniel... And then we're in the, in the furnace. I mean, I started to think about this morning. How many other people had, you know, had their judgment to go into that furnace? I mean, that furnace was made for that, I'm assuming. <laughs> the furnace was a place of affliction that Nebuchadnezzar made so that people who didn't follow his law could be Burnt to a crisp. I mean, like, crispy critters in there. So Daniel and, you know, his buddies, I can't remember their Hebrew names, and I kind of feel bad saying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because that's not really really their names. But when they go in the fire, they are unharmed. Nothing is, not even one hair is singed on their bodies. They don't even smell like smoke. You know, and I can tell you, I just really believe this all my heart, that when they came out, now, maybe when they were going in, they were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's hot. I don't want to go in there. You know I mean, I'm, to think that they were not afraid would be stupid. I, I know we like to think of them as so holy that, you know, they were probably thinking, wait a second, I didn't worship. What the heck is going on with this thing? I got to go in that. 
because they didn't, they, didn't, um, they didn't sin against God. They were following the commandments of the Lord. And so if God should protect them from anything, he should be protecting them from the fire. So I don't know what was going on in their, in their brains, but, you know, when they're in the middle of it, all of a sudden Jesus shows up in the fire. And when they come out on the other side, like nothing on them. I have a feeling that they turned around, looked at that fire and that furnace, and they were like, well, that was awesome. <laughs> Did you see that? That was amazing. <laughs> I mean, you got to feel a little, you know, like, that's right. That was me in that fire. You know, you, you get a little. <laughs> because victory feels good. Look, I know you want to be all holy and, but look, victory feels good. When you're getting your butt kicked, you are not happy. Because the Bible's very clear. We sang about it. That he has finished it. The victory is ours. It's done. It's finished. And if we don't have victory, it's not his fault. There's something in error in us in believing. So all of the things that we go through are still worth it. We still find this, this sweet spot when we, when we come into that overcoming uh, place in our lives where we're, we all say it was worth it. And we feel good. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it when you stand there and you look at Jesus and you're like, wow, with grace and your power, we whipped that thing. Yes, we did. And you feel kind of good about it. Your testimony is like, oh, I failed again. No, your testimony is, that's right, I rocked that out. Whoop, that's right. My bill got paid, or you know what I mean? My baby came. Whatever thing it is you're needing from God, when you get it, you're not quiet about it because it matters. It matters. And can I just say that sometimes we have promises of God, and the enemy wants us. It, he, he torments us with the promise to the point where we begin to try to lie to ourselves and say, ah, it doesn't matter. If I never have that, it doesn't matter. That's a lie. It does matter to you. And you trying to pretend that it doesn't is keeping you in a place of sorrow and disappointment. You need to own what God has promised you instead of putting it aside. Well, yes, I do want that. And it may seem wrong to everybody else, but if God has showed you what you're supposed to do, and you say, I want to go to Africa, and I want to be the, the next Reinhard Bonnke, and I want to preach to millions at a time, and someone will say to you, oh, well, you know, I don't know if you're really ready for that. You know what? Don't kill somebody else's dream. Just go pursue it and go run after it. And if it's 20 years later and you're still not doing it, don't tell yourself, well, I, don't ever, I never really wanted it. That's a lie because you did. <laughs> I know. There's some things I'm pulling out of my journals. I'm like, hey, wait a second. Hey, I ain't got that word yet. I want that word. And there's nothing wrong with us saying that. If I told Ashlyn that I had an envelope in a drawer with her name on it that had $500 in it, and she was like, okay, but you know, i got to do some stuff, Mom. I'll be back later. If she never goes back to get the $500, whose fault is it? It's hers. She has to, like, go to the drawer and pick it out. It's hers. And if she was to be in my presence and begin to tell me the torment that she has because she has this bill that's due and it's $500, I would be like, oh, uh, I told you where it was. It has... I don't move the money. I keep it there exactly where I said it was. But I'm not going to go get it for her because I've already made the money and I've put it into a place where it's available to her. So she has to be the one to trust me and say, it's in that drawer. I know it's there. And no matter how much she cries because that bill is due, no matter how much she is laboring in pain because this burden that's on her life, I cannot fix it for her because I've already told her where the answer is. And oftentimes, we do this with the Lord. He's like, look, baby, I gave you a promise. I told you exactly where it was. I told you what, what address it lived at. And no matter where it is, 
we can know exactly where the provision is. And no matter how much we cry and we lament and tell God we need it, we need it, all he's going to say is, I've already done it. I finished it for you. It's yours. But why won't you put it on me? No, it's your job to take it off and to put it on. It's your responsibility, not mine. And I may be moved by Ashlyn's tears because I know she's hurting. But I gave her a command. She's a source and a command. And the only thing that she lacks is obedience and faith. But let's just say in her life she had 10 other people at some point. Not a parent, just people that told her, that $200 you need, I put it in an envelope over there in a drawer. That $100 you need, Ashley, I put it over there in an envelope in a closet. And every time she went to open it up, there was never an envelope. But they weren't her parent. They weren't the father. And so when the father says, it's in the drawer, her disappointment hindered her faith because she's been lied to over and over again. And it could hurt my heart that she's not believing me. And I would say, I'm not them. I'm your mother. I'm not them. And now she distrusts me because people have lied to her. And this is what we do in the kingdom of God. We have been abused. We have been let down. We have been disappointed by so many people. And in the evilness of this world that we live in, it's sometimes even our parents that do the evil to us. But we have a heavenly father who has proven his goodness to us by giving us Jesus. He's given us Jesus. And we can't treat him the way we do everybody else who disappointed us. And this is where healing begins. You feel his presence in here? See, there's a grace to believe today. He loves you. Oh, he loves you. We are all sons and daughters of God. And beloved, you know, look, and, and, the, and the word tells us that in the spirit there's neither male nor female. When Adam was first created, he was created both male and female. He had a womb, everything, you know, and he, the Lord took that out of him and made Eve, okay? So, but spiritually speaking, inside of us all, even if you're a man, is the ability to birth the promises of God. Because there's neither male nor female. When we are recreated, in Christ, we now have a new DNA, we have a new makeup, and God has made all of us as children of God, given us the ability to carry a promise and to birth it out. We all have that ability, okay? So you men, you just be like, you just tell yourself, I'm going to birth this thing, you know what I mean? So you're like, I'm a man, I, look, look, birth it, okay? You always say we're pregnant, which is a lie. You ain't pregnant with your wife, so you might as well just start <laughs> claiming the other thing, too. When people say, oh, we're pregnant, I'm like, no, she's pregnant. You are not pregnant. She's pregnant. Y'all may be having a baby. She's pregnant. <laughs> Except for today. <laughs> today, you're all pregnant. I need to hear, besides David, I need to hear some men say Amen. <laughs> so we have all we all have the ability <laughs> you're so retarded i love you <laughs> we all have the ability the the word tells us in the parable of the sower you know he's like some are, some seeds fell on good ground so some fell on stony ground okay and jesus actually gives us the answer to the parable because he tells us that the seed is the word of god right so 
when we receive the word of God, if we, have, if we have it in a place where our heart has been ready for the seed, then when that fruit comes to pass, it's the same thing like you're birthing a promise, okay? So I, the reason I want to say that is because I really, I, I was kind of stunned when I, it just kind of popped into my head yesterday evening. Um, the Lord showed me, I was talking to um, Pastor about, um, a message that Lou Engel had ministered at Open Heavens in Los Angeles. And, you know, Lou Engel is not really a, a conference speaker, but, you know, he's, a, he's an amazing man. I mean, the, his life for Jesus is stunning. It's stunning. It makes me feel like I'm nothing. Um, but he, he was um, equating um, or he talked about the battle over the womb. That from the beginning in the garden, the battle was over the womb because the prophetic word was that the seed would come forth and he would crush his head and bruise his heel, okay? So the enemy knew in the beginning that, that if she was to birth, that it would be a big problem. Reproduction and sons are a huge threat to darkness because the more sons of light that are born, the less darkness there will be. So reproduction in our lives is vitally important. We should be reproducing promises. We should be reproducing people. We should be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, leading people into salvation. You, you and I are laborers in this earth for that very purpose. So reproduction was part of the original mandate in the garden, and it has not changed. And with Jesus, I'm trying to give the whole gospel real quickly. With Jesus... We now have the fulfillment of being able to, or the ability now to fulfill that original garden commandment, right? So I began to think about, it is, this is not what Lou ministered at all, because it kind of shocked me. I was like, wait a second. The Lord sh- says to me, he said, God, or I, loves for glory to be born by faith. And I'm like, Yeah. Because faith is the outcome. Glory comes. What's glory? The appearing, the manifestation of God. That's what glory is. It's not, you know, dust on you and, you know, gold stuff all over you. And it it may appear that way. But really, glory is you walking in the manifested word of God. So when he's, when he says you're healed, when you walk in total healing, You are giving glories on the earth saying God is alive and he's real and he's active in our life. And that's the manifestation of the power of God. Yes. Okay. So God loves for glory to come into the earth by you and I. However, and just bear with me for a second. (laughs) It's going to seem like wah, wah. Usually... Whenever there's anything major birthed, it comes behind a heart that is usually in brokenness. The seedbed of faith and the soil in us usually is in brokenness, um, disappointment, rejection, anger, loneliness, bitterness, unforgiveness. And those areas of our life that are so hard for us is actually the very soil that's necessary for you and I to bring forth the promise of God. That your ability to birth never comes from you being right and not having any struggle. Your ability to birth the promises of God comes from the very source of your hurt. And I began to think, and immediately I saw four people in the Word of God, like it was like almost like a slideshow in front of me. And I saw so clearly that every single broken place in you and I is actually the place where promises are born. Even us sitting in this place today was birthed out of great 
pain and sorrow. It was in the pain and the sorrow of our daughter's death that we heard the call of God very clearly. And it would seem crazy in the natural for two people and our children who are in a place of great sorrow to begin to step out and bring glory to God. Because most people said, maybe you did something wrong, that's why she's gone. People were dumb. But in that pain, just like Daniel in the furnace, I was like, you see that? There was some hurt, yes. I'm not saying we don't have feelings, but at the end of it all, I'm not burdened down by the sorrow of the pain. I am am free and have joy and can produce the glory of God through it. So there's a testimony in our lives that in the midst of horrible pain, God's glory was manifested in the earth. And we, we did what God told us to do. And you're all here today because of our pain. But more importantly... Because of our victory. Because we allowed faith to come into that seedbed of hurt. I'm going to look at four births in the Word of God. And this is very clear to me that with every um, move or dispensation of God, there's always a storm around some births. So let's look at Genesis chapter 15. Y'all ready? If you're not, either make yourself or you can leave. Just be quiet. <laughs> we don't want you to leave. We want you to stay here. But we love you, but if you've got to go, you got to go. <laughs> There's a unity of the faith in here today. Okay, Genesis 15, verses 2 and 3 says, oh, I guess let's go to 1, sorry. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. Woohoo! that's a great word. And Abram said, uh, there's a problem with your promise. Come on. Abraham didn't say, woo-woo! He said, what can you give me? Come. What can you give me since I don't have a kid? It's, I don't know about any of you, but wouldn't you kind of respond the same way? If the one thing you desired more than anything in the world was a son, a legacy, to keep on your name and, and to be, have, be able to be a blessing in the earth, and God says to you, hey, I'm awesome. And I'm going to reward you, and you're great. He's like, look, what are you going to get me? Because this thing is dead around here. So I understand you want to bless me, but there ain't no keeping on, keeping on in here. Come on. Uh, you don't believe me. Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? That's craziness. Since I'm going on childless and he, who shall, and he who shall be the owner and the heir of my house is the steward, Eliza of Damascus. Abraham continued like he didn't know where to go far enough. <laughs> like, he's like Peter, sticking foot in mouth. He says, look, you've given me no child, and a servant born in my house is my heir. He's telling God the reason for my circumstances is because of you. So don't you come and tell me that you're going to give me something great and be my reward because as far as I'm concerned, you're the problem. Now, that may not be the way you read it, but that's the way I read it. (laughs) It's not blasphemous, I swear to God. Lightning will not strike me. I say that. How funny would it be if lightning struck me just then? I'm just not funny like me. I wouldn't be funny. It'd be funny to you guys. It's kind of like when someone trips and falls and you're like, "Uh I'm sorry, are you okay? 
my husband one time, we were in San Francisco, and he's like coming from the Nike store, and he tripped so hard. I mean, I don't even know how he did it. Because this, this, it was kind of a strange little, anyways, he fell so hard. He fell. Poof, and I was on the bench, and I was dying laughing. I mean, he could have. He could have broken bones, and I did not care. It was so funny to see his big old butt tumbling down them stairs. Oh, my God. It was so, that's what I left San Francisco with. All my memories of San Francisco is that right there. Him by the Nike store. Yes. So funny. So funny. One time, I, I used to have a stun gun. And, yeah, yeah, taser. And uh, I loved it. Okay. There's nothing funnier. Nothing funnier than someone being tased. If you don't believe me, go to YouTube, do a little search. There's one guy that he says, oh, you hammered me. It's hilarious. You got, he's drunk. It's so funny. And drunk people, they keep getting up when they're tased. It's absolutely hilarious. Well, anyways, I had a stun gun. This was years ago before it was all, before officers had it, all that stuff. And I was, I would, my friends, they hated me. I would, <laughs> and if you do it where, like, an elbow or shoulder, your, your joints, it travels further. It's like there's a, a pathway. So I would, like, I would do their hips when they're sitting next to me, and I, I would just cry laughing. So funny. So funny. And they were all so mad at me, the ones who got stunned. But all the other people with me were laughing with me, too. And so they understood why I was doing it. <laughs> but I was never stupid enough to give anybody. My stun gun, because, you know, you were not going to do me. <laughs> Until one fine day. I had that stun gun, and I tased my friend, but my arm had touched her, and we both went down. And I was like, that is not fun. That's not funny. <laughs> so I put it away. <laughs> I had to feel some of my own pain before I would stop doing it. But it's still hilarious anyway. So <laughs> if lightning did hit me, it would be kind of funny. It would be on YouTube for sure. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Okay. So Abraham's like, look, I have a deep desire inside of me. And what I need is that desire fulfilled. And at this point... Abram doesn't, he's not full of faith. He's telling God. He's not like a super faith man with the big F on, you know, cape on. He's, he's got issues. Believing him. And that's how it usually happens to us. God releases a promise in the very thing that's the most frustrating. <sighs> I, I'm living this right now. Oh, Jesus. And he's not the only one who's upset about it. Look at Genesis chapter 16. We talked about Hagar last week. 16 verse 2, it says, because Sarah's like, you know, hey, I'm going to give you my Hagar, my thing. She said to Abraham, see here, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Who? The Lord. And, and of course, now we know that in those days, it, people thought it was a judgment on their household. They couldn't give children. It, didn't have, they, it was sin or something. But she is actually taking the full responsibility for barrenness. Like, I'm thinking, well, it could be that, you know, your man is sterile. I mean, hello. You know what I mean? That is a possibility, right? They didn't know that at the time, though, until Hagar. When he and Hagar get together, Ishmael is produced. Can you imagine the agony in Hagar? Because even if there was a possibility that it was Abraham, now she knows it's not she already thought the problem was her, and now she knows the problem is her. Come on. I'm up in your business. I know that. It's different when you are faced with all the conjecture that it could have been is wiped away, and it's just you. It's just you and your failure and your pride and your issue is just you. Can't blame nobody else, not because somebody hurt you or somebody molested you or because of this, that, that. None of that matters. All your, none of that matters. You know it's not anybody else's fault. It's you. That's a harsh place to be. 
I can't even imagine when Ishmael was born what Sarah was thinking. Now look at verse um, chapter 18. Let's go over here real quick. Starting at verse 10. So now there's, they're all hanging out over here at their house. And um, verse 10 says, The Lord said, I will surely return to you when the season comes around. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening and heard it at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years. It had ceased to be with Sarah's. As with the young women, she was past the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become old, menopausal, now you're going to tell me my pleasure and delight are going to be fulfilled. I know it's a little word a little bit different than when I said it, but that's. <laughs> she's like, she gives us a very clear indication of what's really going on in her heart. Pleasure and delight have been stolen from her. For a long time. Because she's an old lady. So she's showing us that the one thing that she wanted the most was this baby. Yeah, pleasure and delight is coming to the very place that is dead as dead can be. Because that's the place where faith is. Look, there are things that you have in your life that you have longed for. And they look so dead to you, like they are deader than dead. And I want you to hear the word of the Lord. It's not dead. That's the very place where glory and manifestation and promise is going to be released. Y'all did not even get that like I wanted you to get that. Mm -mm -mm. Genesis 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he said he would, and the Lord did for her as he had promised. For Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time God had told them. Abraham named his son whom Sarah bore to him Isaac, which means laughter. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. All who hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children at the breast? For I have borne him a son in this old age. The world begins to see the glory of God because an old lady who desperately wanted a child gave birth to a child. And this child was not just any child. He was the foundation of the entire nation. God came into the earth to birth a nation. And he did it through this promise, through Isaac. He didn't destroy the world through Noah. But Noah did not receive the same promise that Abraham received. And Abraham's promise and Isaac being birthed is the very thing that we now get to partake in. And Pastor gave a great message about it for weeks on end about how the blessing of Abraham is ours. And we forget that it came through the deadest thing and the worst hurt that they ever went through. But my Jesus, when he showed up, <laughs> they were laughing and rejoicing and having a good old time. Mm -mm. Exodus chapter 1. You all right? Look, at, we're going to do verse 16 and then 22. And then we're going to go into Exodus chapter 2. It says, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it's a daughter, he shall live. Now, that's not very nice. Um, and then Pharaoh charged all the people in verse 22, saying, every son born to the Hebrews you will cast into the river, but every daughter you will allow them to live. So he was saying, every boy that's born, drown him in the, in the river. I mean, that's horrible. Drown him in the river. This is the storm that's raging with Israel. 
Joseph has died. There's a new pharaoh. There's a, a new man in charge. And everything about where they were before was pleasant. And now it was slavery. It was burdened. It was horrible. And to make matters worse, the reproducing of Israel was to be stopped by killing the son. Come on. Why? Because the seed in a man is vitally important. There can't be no birthing. So Pharaoh releases a judgment saying all of them have to die if they're born a son. So in the weightiness of that, and you can read it in Exodus chapter 2. I won't go read the whole thing. But Moses' mother, she's married, and then she has, she finds out that she's pregnant. Now, I don't know what it would be like to be a mother who is pregnant in in a place where I know there's a 50% chance of what I'm about to birth is about to die. And not of natural causes, because of a judgment. So she doesn't have ultrasounds. She don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Can you just imagine that for that entire time, whenever she would try to feel joy about being pregnant and having a baby, there was always this dread in the back of her heart. What if? What if it's a boy? What are we going to do? What if it's a boy? And so even to the place where she's in labor and she's giving birth to this baby, I'm like, what's going on in her head? Is she begging God for it to be a girl? Well, there's a problem with that because they should be begging God for a boy. Because this is her first child. You want the son to be born first. So everything of the context of where she's at right now is horrendous. And then she births a baby, and holy no, it's a boy. And she looks at him, and she sees, she sees God. He was beautiful, is what the word says. He was exquisite. There was something about Moses that was not like any other baby that they had seen. And she saw it. Now, she has a choice. She's living in a system where if she doesn't follow what they say to do, her own life is at stake. And yet, she decides, in spite of fear, in spite of the circumstances, I'm going to risk it all, I'm going to hide them. Faith is released over Moses by his mother. All that fear, all that dread that had been incubating inside of her for nine months. And she has to make a decision. And she hides him. And then she puts him in a little basket and she covers him up. And at the exactly right time, it's amazing what God can do. She sends her baby down the river. His sister goes and runs along the bank to find out what's going on. It just happens to be the exact moment. The Pharaoh's sister or daughter comes down. And then Miriam's like, you want me to find a Hebrew one to nurse him? And she's like, yes, that's right. And this woman, think about this. She, Miriam gives Moses back to his mother. And she nurses him, cares for him, and then gives him to Pharaoh. That's mind-boggling faith to me. Matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, it talks about not Moses' faith, but the faith of his mother. That in spite of all the fear and the anxiety and the dread, she hid her baby because she knew there was a promise in him. I believe when she saw Moses, she knew there was a deliverer for the nation. That the bondage that they had been in, the fear that had been inside of her, the freedom for her own fear was her son. The very thing that was not supposed to bring freedom and live. That's crazy cool to me. So sometimes we birth the promise and we hold it. And we know it's got this great call on its life. But you have to wait in God's timing. 
and do what God says in obedience. And sometimes it's letting the promise go for a while. But guess who God delivered along with Moses? His mama. So the Lord releases, first, there's this fear dread on the first birth with Isaac, which was the nation being built. And the next time we see it in the word of God with Moses, who's the deliverer of the nation and brings the law of God. He's, he's face to face with the Lord. This is crazy how amazingly anointed that Moses was. He's talking about glory being shown. It's that his, his face was so bright he had to wear a veil. He would ascend the mountain and go through all the stormy uh, thunderings and clouds and all of that into the darkness is what the word says. He would climb this mountain and sit there and have conversations with the Father. I can tell you one thing's for sure. Nobody was like how hard it was when Moses was a baby. They were all fixed and enamored and giving glory to the man who was face to face with God. And a law was set forth that would go on until Jesus. That's good stuff right there, buddy. In the face of terror, you have to believe, guys. We have to believe in the face of terror. We have to have faith to hide the promise sometimes. Protect your promise. Protect it. Sometimes you've got to incubate it. you just got to nurse it until it's ready. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'm just going to paraphrase all this because I know your, your butts are probably outlasting your brain. Um, like we all do. I have the same issue. But now we fast forward and the law has been given, and, and they're in the time of judges where, you know, they were not governed by a king. They, they were governed by God and his people. And Hannah is in torment. She cannot have a baby. And I was telling them in Sunday school today, like, you know, his other wife, poor thing, she was, you know, during the time of polygamy, the other wife was popping out babies left and right. She was like a total fertile myrtle. You know, she was, like, I mean, she was just like having babies left and right. And Hannah, you can read it, Hannah was so depressed. She was so sad and disappointed and weighed down with her inability to have a baby. that The Bible says she was so depressed that she stopped eating. And it was her almost starving herself that made her husband say, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you eating? And he would give her extra portions of food, and he would try to fit, give favors to her and love her a little bit more than he did his other wife because he knew how bad Hannah felt. She was so vexed. The, the word says she's vexed by the birthing of this other woman because that means every single day she's faced with the, this. She knows it's not him. It's not Elkanah. She knows it's her because they're having babies left and right. And again, just like Sarah, she's weighed down with the burden of this. And she gets up. They go to Shiloh every single year. In this one year, she gets up. She goes to Shiloh, and she decides, I'm going to go seek God for myself because I'm hurting so bad. And she falls at her on her face, and she's praying to the Lord, and she's not saying anything out loud. She's just pleading with the Lord out of her own heart, and her lips are moving. And there's one person in the entire nation who has spiritual authority. One. It's Eli. And he looks at her, and he's like, you need to lay off the liquor, woman. Sitting up here drunk, seeking after God. What's wrong with you? That's what he said to her. I know it, you read differently in the King James Version, but that's what he said. You're a drunkard. And she had the opportunity in that moment to either honor the position that he held in the name of the God that she served or to take that offense on her and walk away. But she honored him. Matter of fact, so much so that uh, she didn't come against him that he said, she tells him why. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. Then yes, your womb's blessed. Go. And that word, she took, it says, the Bible says she went back home and she ate. How long had it been since she had a bite of food? Because she was hurting so bad. 
I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to be so burdened down and so weighed down that even the thought of eating seems like it's too much work. But she hears this word. Nothing has changed. She just got a word from a, from a disrespectful priest. How could you put any weight in that? It'd be one thing if he was all holy and didn't make it. But the Bible says he was fat, lazy, and didn't discipline his children. He wasn't, he wasn't a good guy. And that's the man who says to her, then go ahead, have it your way. She heard that. Faith comes by hearing. She heard somebody who wasn't perfect and wasn't holy release something inside of her that activated faith. And the first thing she did was to go eat a dinner. The first thing we have to do when faith is hurling its way to our heart in the midst of our pain is eat. He's the bread of life. We have to eat. She could not go back home and immediately have sex with her husband. Come on, guys, listen to me. She had to go home and eat first. She had to get herself ready. She had to have nourishment in her body to be able to carry a child. If she was anorexic and depressed, no baby would have been able to live. She probably would have miscarried it. But she had to go home and eat. And eating led to intimacy, which led to a baby who was born. Oh, the prophet who would change Israel's understanding of God from the law to the kings of the earth. Samuel set up prophetic schools. He trained people to hear God. Elijah was in Samuel's school. Every prophet you read about sat under the ministry of the man who hit the earth who could hear God in such a way that God allowed him to share what he heard and what he learned with others. And now there are kings in the earth because of Samuel. And, of course, even more so that Jesus is in the earth because Samuel anointed David. Because somebody had to hear and not look at what he saw, but hear God and anoint And it was so important that Samuel anointed David because Jesus would come from the line of David. And he's still called the son of David today. But where did it come from? It came from a heart that was so burdened down with depression and rejection and failure. But that was the very thing that God would use. Ah, Jesus. It wasn't no huge, big old sermon she got. She got one sentence, probably 12 words. And that's all it took. That's all it took was one person saying, you can do it. How many dreams have you torn down yourself? It just takes one person. Jesus, Jesus. So we have a baby who brings forth a nation. We have another baby who brings forth the deliverance and the law. We have another baby who brings forth the prophet and the, uh, the kingdom government that would establish Israel. And we don't see another issue come up about faith and babies that had a major significance in the word of God until you get to Mary. Look, Mary didn't have pain in her heart before the promise. See, sometimes our promises, that seedbed, is, it, are the things that we have in our life that we've been hearing, and, and they're torturous to us, and there's all that pain there. But that's not always the case, and we see that with Mary. 
Because now Mary is in a place where she's free. She's wonderful. She's a virgin. She's going to be married to Joseph. You know, her life's planned out. She's awesome. You know, blah, blah. Mind her own business. Ain't got no clue about nothing. She's out hanging some laundry up. I don't know what she's doing. She's out doing something, and here comes an angel. Like, whoa. Especially after all the silence that was in the earth. 400 years, God ain't spoken to nobody. So God comes and speaks to Sarah. And Mary ain't got no clue about what's going on with Sarah. And then she just minded her own business. About to be married, happy, 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 joy, joy, joy. And the angel shows up and he's like, oh, Mary, you're righteous and beautiful and you're wonderful. And she's like, oh, who are you? She's like, well, thank you for all the compliments. And he's like, you've been found righteous, and you are going to give birth to the Savior of the world. She's like, uh. Her first response is, uh, how's that going to happen? I ain't no, no, man. Immediately. And he was like, oh, but the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and you'll give birth. And he, this whole wonderful prophecy And now, all of a sudden, in this moment, her heart is challenged. Because if you don't think she did not understand the weightiness of what was about to happen before she said, according to your word, let it be for me, we're, we're crazy. She, she's going to get pregnant, not by a man, but by the Spirit of God, when she's already betrothed to a, another man, she knew the repercussions of this promise. They were very clear to her. And there has to be this moment inside of her heart where she's like, oh, my God, my dad's going to kill me, my mom's going to kill me, what's Joseph going to do? She knew she was walking into a great rejection, a great pain, and a great slander. But in order for the Son of God and for glory to appear in the earth in a way that had never seen the glory of God before, the seed, because of past, um, we see the, the principles of the past, the seed had to be planted in some turmoil. It's just the way the word is. If Mary would have been like, this is awesome, overshadow me. And she's like walking around, woohoo, look, I'm pregnant, woo. You know, in our culture, you know, we, we don't think anything like that they, they did. I mean, at all. And she didn't walk through life saying, I got the Son of God. You know what I mean? She parading around, you know, telling everybody what was going on. Whoop, whoop, God chose me. I'm the righteous virgin. Yup, yup, yup. None of that. It had to be planted in a heart that had to allow itself to be burdened and accused and ripped apart and judged. And that wasn't even the greatest pain she would ever end up enduring. The greatest one even came later. And why? Because in order for life to come, there had to be another pain. And Jesus shows us the very same thing. He had the promises of the Father inside of him, but in order for them to come to the earth and for glory to be manifested, he had to die. And his time in the garden, when he was so weighted down with the sin of the world, it was in the garden of Gethsemane that the Lord is, is completely destroying the enemy. It wasn't on the cross. It was in that garden. It was at that tree when he was on his face crying and hurting so bad that blood was coming out of the pores of his skin. Because blood was being shed there for you and I. Not just on the cross. But in order for him to birth what the Lord, had, the, the Father had put inside of him, he had to endure the same kind of pain that you and I endure. It was the only way for glory to come. Come on, beloved. It was the only way for glory to come. And not just Jesus feeling the weight of that pain, the Father 
felt the weightiness of that pain. And he shows us over and over again. That place is the very thing that you're about to birth something huge in. If you will just believe. Just believe. That seems so stupid, but just believe. I know I'm faced with monumental things in front of me. And all I hear the Lord saying is, just believe. Just believe. Have faith in me constantly. Just believe. But that seems so stupid and so simple. I know. Just believe. Why? Because it's finished. It's done. I've already done it. The money's in the drawer, Annette. The money's in the drawer. All you got to do is get up and go to the drawer, Annette. Well, what drawer, God? What drawer? He's like, just keep looking. You'll find the right drawer. It's in the drawer. And the joy of opening that drawer and seeing that envelope there, and not with just who it may concern, but Annette's name on the envelope, that God, before the earth was ever created, put that envelope of money in the drawer. Before I knew I had a need, he provided the money in the drawer. He's way too good. He's way too good. Can I read one scripture to you? And then I'm done. Oh, Jesus. You know, faith always releases the power of the word of God. Always. Always. Faith releases the power. That's why there's a warfare over our mouth to complain. To keep yourself in the room down and out. Look, I know I've been sucking my own thumb for a long time, but I'm freaking done with it. I'm taking my thumb out of my mouth and I'm going to start saying what God says. Jesus. First Peter chapter 4. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. Verse 12, he says, beloved friends, this is Peter, guys, come on now. The denier, you know, Peter, the dumb one who tried to rebuke Jesus. Peter, beloved friends, if life gets extremely difficult with many tests, don't be bewildered as though something strange were overwhelming you. It should be a compliment, eventually. The pain, the turmoil of your promise is an indicator that it's there. That's the crazy thing. We hear that preach all the time. I'm like, I don't want to hear that again. It sucks. I don't want to hear it. But it's the truth. The pain is the indicator. That's where the glory is. Come on. The pain is the indicator that that's where the glory is. Oh. Instead, instead of like, you know, being all bleh, instead, continue to rejoice. For you, in a measure, have shared in the sufferings of the anointed one so that you can share in the revelation of his glory. And celebrate with even greater gladness. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are greatly blessed. Because the spirit of glory and power, who is the spirit of God, is resting upon you. Woo, Jesus. We have been resurrected. We have already been resurrected from the grave. It's already happened. So let's start living like people who have life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus. I feel better. You feel better? Amen. Let's stand up. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Say, Lord, Lord, I believe. I believe. 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 Oh, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We harness the unbelief inside of our hearts right now. I declare that there's a day of rejoicing in our heart, and the very places 
where there has been pain, that there is a heart of thanksgiving that will begin to bubble up from our mouths and begin to praise you and thank you for every single storm, for every single mountain, for every single valley, for every single insult, for every single trial. We thank you, Jesus, because we know in it we are co-laboring with you, that we are becoming one with you, and you are wrapping yourself in your presence. We are in Christ Father, I ask that grace would be released over every heart here. Grace, grace, grace for faith. Grace for faith. Father, I thank you that in the birthing of our promises that we are bringing damage to the kingdom of darkness. And just like you, your your heel was bruised, so our heel is bruised also because we are your body. Father, we ask that you would bring greater glory to this earth through our lives of surrender and faith to you that we would begin to be people who declare the promises that you have given to us, that no matter how bad it looks, we know there's a drawer, and in the drawer there's an envelope, and you put our name on it because you saw us long before we ever got to this place. Oh, Jesus. I ask for the spirit of wisdom, insight, revelation. to come upon our hearts, Lord, to get us to see what we cannot see yet. And I ask for hope, that their expectation of good, of your goodness coming upon us on our hearts and in our lives, your favor that you've bestowed upon us, the blessings, everything. Father, we know that we say yes to them now and we cling to them. And we just say no to the unbelief that may have a louder voice in our hearts at times. And we just begin to continually declare, Lord, I believe, I believe, I believe you're able. I believe you're able. I believe that I'm an overcomer. I believe that I triumph in Christ. I believe that I'm the head and not the tail. I believe, Lord. I believe that you came to save me, to set me free. I believe, Lord. I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe I'm going to birth the promise. I believe that you're healing me. I believe, God. Forgive us, Lord, where we have given more attention to our doubt and the woundedness of our own hearts, and we haven't been able to see the promise inside of it. Forgive us, Lord. And as you forgive us, Lord, just deposit a grace and a hope in a love that's just so far out of this world, it stuns us. We believe, Jesus. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your victory, Jesus. It's finished. It is done. The blood of Jesus has overcome. We have one already, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Woo, Jesus. There's something going on. I want to pray with you. We're going to dismiss, and you can, but I just feel like I need to, if you need prayer, that I'm going I'm to wait with you, and I'll, I will pray with you. I will come into agreement and faith with you. That's all I can do. Um, but if, if the promise has been so wounding that you need someone to pray with you, I, I'm making myself available, okay? I love you guys. We'll see you tonight at 530. Yes? All right. I love you. Peace out.